So the question is, is it beneficial to be exposed to sunlight when you're an elder? And the answer is yes, because we and Ian Reed and others have done studies to show if you take elders and put them out on a veranda, expose their arms and their legs to sunlight, you can raise their blood levels to 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And it's good for them to be out in the sun because sunlight can increase beta endorphin, make you feel better. And it has a whole host of other benefits, including uh, producing nitric oxide, releasing nitric oxide, causing your blood pressure to decrease to feel more relaxed. Now, do elders need more vitamin D? And the answer, in my opinion, is no. Because again, we did the study. <laughs> we asked the question because it was argued that vitamin D absorption is decreased in elders. So we did the study and we showed that vitamin D absorption is equally efficient, whether you're 20 years old or 80 years old. How much more vitamin D should elders take? I don't think they need to take any more. I think that everyone, everyone should be on at least 1,500 to 2,000 units a day or equivalent. And like I said, if you're obese, you need two to three times more. I personally take uh, 6,000 units every day. My circulating concentration of 25 hydroxy D um, is around... 80 nanograms per ml or 200 nanomoles per liter. Yeah, because I remember you said if you wanted to have like 150, you needed about 4,000. Was, was that what you said? 4, yeah, 4 to 5,000 units a day. Yeah. And, yeah. and here's another interesting observation that Bruce Hollis and Carol Wagner made and that I kind of try to make as a, as a significant point in terms of looking at evolution and how vitamin D has played such a fundamental role. We know that breast milk, human breast milk, essentially contains no vitamin D. Now, if you think about this from an evolution perspective, this makes no sense. And it turns out that Bruce Hollis and Carol Wagner showed if you give lactating women 6,400 units of vitamin D a day, they put enough vitamin D in their milk to satisfy their infant's requirement. So that's telling us, again, from an evolutionary perspective, that our hunter-gatherers outside every day were making probably thousands, four to 6,000 units of vitamin D in their skin on a daily basis and maintaining their blood levels of vitamin D, as well as their 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Yes. So one of the key benefits, one of the key functions of vitamin D is to maintain bone health. And also, as we get older, there is danger of having osteopenia and, and the bones becoming weaker. So how how is kind of vitamin D involved with that? How what other supplements along with vitamin D should we use to maintain our bone health? So I wrote a review on this recently. Uh, for bone health, what vitamin D can and cannot do. And I make it very clear um, that I guess maybe some, can be some sometimes a little bit upsetting to the reader until they go really delve into this. Vitamin D cannot treat osteoporosis, okay? So what does vitamin D do? So vitamin D is critically important for increasing the efficiency of the absorption of calcium from your diet. Calcium is critically important for most metabolic functions, signal transduction. The body cares about your blood calcium almost more than anything else because everything is tied to it. So if you're not getting enough calcium in your diet, the body knows this and it instantly begins a process of trying to find calcium from someplace. So the first thing it does is that when you become vitamin D deficient and calcium absorption is decreasing, your ionized calcium slightly goes down and it immediately is recognized by your parathyroid glands, the four glands in your neck. There's a calcium sensor. It instantly gets turned on and parathyroid hormone is being made. Parathyroid hormone does three things. First, and most important, it goes to your kidneys, and it tells your kidneys, hey, stop losing so much calcium in the urine. So it increases tubular reabsorption of calcium. The second, it tells the kidneys to activate more vitamin D. Now, how can you do that if you're vitamin D deficient? And the answer is that even tiny amounts of 25-hydroxy vitamin D that, that consider you to be vitamin D deficient can still be utilized by the kidney 
and the parathyroid hormone telling the kidney to activate it. People that are vitamin D deficient can often be found to have a low 25 hydroxy vitamin D and normal or elevated 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. But you're not satisfying the intestine. The intestine's not getting enough 125 dihydroxy vitamin D to increase the efficiency of calcium absorption. The third is if you're not getting enough from your diet and you can't conserve enough from your kidneys, then the last place, of course, is your bank, which is your bones. And so now parathyroid hormone will increase numbers of osteoclasts and these cells release hydrochloric acid, cathepsin K, to destroy the collagen, and it leaves a hole in your bone. Now you're decreasing both matrix and mineral, and you're decreasing bone mineral density, causing osteopenia. And if you continue that process, you will lead to osteoporosis. So now you have another problem, which is the parathyroid hormone, when it goes to your kidneys, to increase tubular reabsorption of calcium, it causes you to lose phosphate in your urine. And so now your calcium and your phosphate product are different. They need to be normal, just like making concrete, having cement and the proper amount of water and sand, right, to make good concrete. To make bone mineral, you need an adequate calcium and an adequate amount of phosphate. But if the phosphate is now low and your calcium is normal because you're getting it out of your bone, the newly laid down collagen matrix by your osteoblasts cannot get mineralized. Hence, you have what's called a mineralization defect. That mineralization defect causes you to have osteomalacia or in children, rickets. Why is that important? Because not only is that collagen not structurally sound, therefore to increase your risk for fracture, but more importantly, that collagen gets hydrated like jello. And so often patients complain of throbbing, aching bone pain especially in the wintertime. And they're often given the diagnosis of fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome or whatever. I see those patients. Most of them were vitamin D deficient. I would treat them for their vitamin D deficiency and they'd have a dramatic improvement in their symptoms. So long story short is that when you're vitamin D deficient, you increase parathyroid hormone, you increase loss of mineral and matrix. Any new matrix being laid down can't get mineralized. And as a result, you now have lower bone density. You have your structural integrity has been compromised, increasing risk for fracture. Now, when you treat vitamin D deficiency, all of a sudden you see an increase in your bone density. And you think, aha, I've treated my osteoporosis. No, what you've done is, because like I said, when you lose your matrix and mineral, Vitamin D cannot matrix and then mineralize, right? It can only mineralize your matrix. And so what happens in people that are severely vitamin D deficient that have osteomalacia, so this unmineralized matrix that you can't see on x-ray, instantly begins to be mineralized. And so now your bone density goes up and now you improve the structural integrity of your skeleton. We had one patient that had a, a particular rare disease called tumor-induced osteomalacia, where the phosphate level was super low. And when we corrected that problem, increased the bone density by almost 50% in just a few years. Many of my uh, Black patients that were severely vitamin D deficient, right, because their skin pigment is like a natural sunscreen, reducing their ability to make vitamin D. I could show very nicely 5, 10, 15% increase in their bone density within one to two years just by correcting their chronic vitamin D deficiency. Okay. So if, if you're chronically short on vitamin D, then th this will lead to osteo osteoporosis, osteoporosis. Yep. You can put holes in your bones, right. basically. Okay. And then we need sufficient calcium as well, I guess. Absolutely. And so the recommendation, I have all my patients, a thousand milligrams of elemental calcium a day. And it's important to know elemental calcium, right? Because calcium carbonate, which is typically that comes from oyster shell, right, is the most common calcium supplement. Only 40% of it is calcium, 60% is carbonate. And calcium citrate, only 20% is calcium, and about 80% is the citrate. So you need to read carefully on the label. I typically recommend try to get it from your diet. And for me, dairy, 
worm now, they have oat milk and, and other types of forms uh, contain calcium, right? These are good sources of calcium.